two readings this morning. The first one is, it is Psalm 116. Yes, it is. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The second reading is Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. So, Thanksgiving. <clears throat> give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And we've just heard so many things to give thanks for. And what we're going to have a look really briefly today is the fact that giving thanks for good stuff isn't the problem so much as doing it in the light and presence of bad stuff and it's the magnitude of the bad stuff in our heads in our hearts and our minds which determines the magnitude of our thanksgiving i mean i should imagine there are birthdays taking place in war zones right now but they might not be filled with thanksgiving. So it all depends what's present to dilute it. And we'll see here a difference between old covenant dynamics and new covenant dynamics. We have this first psalm, and it's a classic psalm. to go to many wonderful lines there that you can use devotionally. Um, interesting. There's this idea of the rest for the soul. Remember, Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary. And he talks about taking his yoke upon him, learning from him because he's gentle and humble of heart. And you'll find rest for your soul. So this concept isn't, you know, just in the New Testament. Um, Lord's being good to you. Talk into yourself. Why are you so downcast within me, O oh my soul? Talk into yourself. You might want to choose 
a careful place where you do that. <laughs> but talking to yourself. But basically, the Old Testament dynamic is, I will give thanks because you've come up with the goods, Lord. The problem has been removed. And you see the problem with that in terms of normal life. Because until the next time that the problems come, can you still give thanks? So I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Why? Because, Lord, you come through and you can see it in the text if you want to go away and see what the, the psalmist is claiming the Lord has done for them. And here I will sacrifice thank offerings. There are even a provision in the temple worship to come along and provide a thanks offering. So it's part of the people of God's sort of ebb and flow of life and worship and devotion. Call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my um, vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now, the problem is for Thanksgiving is the what I've called the scale. And we'll just get this in our head just briefly. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this because we haven't got an awful lot of time. So let's just say there's a scale of bad stuff over here, good stuff over here, so sorrow and joy. That's not rocket science, is it? So that makes sense, doesn't it, in a conventional way. If you're down this end, joy's going to be tough. If you're up this end, sorrow might be tough, yeah? The problem with the Christian life is it's holding both at the same time. And we have the Holy Spirit within us to help us to understand that. It's through intimacy and union with God that is the only way that's possible. And that will only be achieved through a practice of lifetime of devotion with the Lord. That's a relationship building thing, not an information gathering thing. And the trouble with a lot of our um, well-meaning sort of practices are they're no more than a quite you know, gaining more information so we know more about God without actually knowing him better. So where's the fulcrum? Where, where, where is the fulcrum in your life right now at this point in time? Which one's given the sway? Is it joy and thanksgiving or is it sorrow? What's going on in your lives? What's going on in the world? Where's the world on that scale? Is it up here? where there's so much bad stuff going on, it doesn't matter how much good event happens and something wonderful happens, this dominates our well-being. Our shalom is not there. There's no peace because of brooding over all this stuff. What ifs and maybes? Tons of this is speculation. Tons of this is not reality. It's speculation of what ifs and maybes. Or maybe it's down here. And something so colossally wonderful has happened that it doesn't matter... Bad stuff isn't really going to dilute it in any way. Do you get that? And of course, the challenge is, 1 Thessalonians, Paul, going deep, and we'll go deep with Paul today. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So is that a, <gasps> you're for me, that's good news. This is your will for my life, or... What are, you, what are you on? So one is conventional human thinking, even if you're a Christian, just dominated and discipled from birth to allow external agenda events to dominate your response. And that's, Lord, what are you asking me? I just have to try hard. But over here, getting it, seeing it clearly, the union with God and you're for me. I can do that because it's your will for me. And look at the price you paid so I can. Yeah? So two different positions, and we might be somewhere in between, or we might go from one to the other. But those are realities right in this room now. Each one of us, including me, is somewhere in this sort of tension between acting like a normal human being and our emotional, psychological response being understandable by any human or some other side where it's just like oh my goodness it doesn't matter what happens out here I have this joy but also sorrow and we'll see how Paul helps us
understand that. So here's our passage. And all I'm going to do is just pull out themes that are in it, okay, that you might not have seen before, rather than go through it meticulously, as we haven't got time. So the first thing is a result from doing stuff. So the first one is, you know, rejoice in all ways, let your gentleness be re, um, um, evident to all. Don't be anxious by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, protest. Every, and what, what will happen? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's the result of that. And then down here, finally, whatever, just think about good stuff and what will happen and the God of peace will be with you. See, he's basically repacing the repeating the same thing. So the fact that there is a result from some way of being, some level of Christian consciousness, self and the world. Does that make sense? So what's another theme? It's a secret one that's in there. Attention to the presence of God. So up here, the Lord's near. We can't get much closer than being in us, can he? So the Lord's near. It says he'll guard in Christ Jesus, Paul's favorite term in all of his letters for referring to all of the stuff about what the cross and resurrection is about, being in Christ. It's mystical. It's difficult to get. What does it mean being in Christ? But it is about relationship. It's about spiritual union. And if you're finding a trouble dealing with that phrase, that might be a result of the tradition you've been part of and what's emphasized. And then down here, the God of peace will be with you, will be with you. So it's not just the peace, it's the presence. All of the good stuff happens because of the presence of God. There is no, I'll give you the 10 point way of achieving this, but you were born to be able, well, with the capacity to be able to understand and receive this. And Christ died on the cross and poured out his spirit so that you can. And it's more important than anything else in your life. Your relationship with God, the stronger that is, the clearer it is, everything else falls into place. So, attention to the present and the fact that it is everything. Throughout this passage, it's always to all, it's evident to all. Don't be anxious about anything in every situation transcends all understanding whatever is true whatever all that's true all that's noble every give your attention to it do you get the point it this is huge this is like totally in, um, inclusive not exclusive you can't say ah oh, but i had this happened to me when i was a kid or or, or this is going on in my life sorry whatever that is and how much of a claim it's got on you, the balance of your scale, here's the antidote. Here's the antidote. It's available. So, and of course, here's the passage in terms of us having a look at Thanksgiving. Because with it, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, in prayer and petition, with Thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Does it work? I've said, God, please sort this out. And I've forgotten all about it now. I'm not anxious. Or is it still brooding? That's the reality, isn't it? This is why this is like so applicational. Because of our minds and the way they're trained and how we see things and, and how we speculate and everything. It's easy. So that's the great Lord. I'm, I'll try not to be anxious. Here we go. And you get well-meaning Christians coming up and saying, oh, the Lord. I just trust the Lord. We have all been and will be in situations where we'll agree with that statement, but it doesn't feel like the right thing to hear right then. Yeah, this is reality. There's a world out there that experiences exactly the same stuff. We shouldn't be responding like the rest of the world. We have something of such magnitude that it brings hope into the most hopeless situation. So if we're buckling, it's not that we're faithless and we don't love Jesus or anything like that, or we're just sinner. No, it's we're not thinking right, and we're not allowing God to manifest everything he's got for us. We're not 
our aspirations and expectations of, as, as being Christians are skew and off center. So, remember this. Don't be anxious about it, but in every situation, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. But that seems like it should imply that should be up this end all the time. Now let's go deeper as Christians into the Bible, because that's a shallow reading. I just got to try harder. But I know I'm not good enough. And you know I'm not good enough. So let's not talk about that. You, you and I wouldn't be asked or commanded, if you want to put it that way, by God to rejoice always if we don't have the capacity. OK, so I'm going to show you a few things now, which is difficult for logic to comprehend. OK. So the tension within the Christian faith, this is all Paul who says rejoice always, pray can continue, good thanks in all circumstances. OK, so this is there are most of them from Corinthians. But here we go. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He's very specific and he goes on to talk about flesh. This isn't some spiritual airy fairy. This is his physical body. But he carries around the death of Christ in some way so that the life of Christ can manifest through his body through the way he thinks, through the way he responds to the world, through his activities. Now, there's a tension in it, the death and the resurrection of Christ all at the same time. He says, all things are yours. There's an argument over favorite preachers. It happens all over the place, doesn't it? <laughs> all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. And he goes off script. He goes off piste here. Or the world are yours. This is for you, yours and mine. So our favorite preachers, he's saying it doesn't really matter. All the preachers are yours. But, but he ups his game. Look, all things are yours, including the world, including life, including death, or the present or the future. All are yours. Why? And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. I hope you don't understand that. Do you understand it? Is that does that sound good? Does that sound epic? Does that sound off the scale cosmic? Well, that's just a taste in some way where you go, oh my goodness, the only way I can get anything out of that is just to spend time by myself with that text and say, Holy Spirit, my logic doesn't help me to get this one. It's too big. Please help me. The result won't be, oh, I get it now. The result will be a transformation in me where I reflect that. Life doesn't matter. Death doesn't matter. Any particular part of the world doesn't matter, the whole world. Why? Because I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. The life I now live in the flesh is the life of Christ. He's in me. There you go. That's off the scale too, isn't it? We as Christians, we want to go, look, look I find it difficult to reduce joy all the time. Just give me some strategy. That's been the downfall of Christianity, which is why there's so many empty chairs in here. It's because we haven't got what's available because we've used logic and cognitive and built our traditions. So you can't bring that into it and you can't bring that into it. And we can talk about God and his plan, but we're not living it out. So let's just move on. <laughs> this says it all. Second Corinthians 6.10, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, both at the same time. Elsewhere, he says in Romans 8, we groan with all creation, waiting for the sons and daughters to be revealed. He also says, I'm not even going to compare what we're going to get with the suffering we're now enduring. You just get that. He's not going to go, this is worth it because this is so good. He's saying, I'm not going to do it. There's no, that's not going to work. That's conventional. So he says this. 
Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away. Hands up who's outwardly wasting away. <laughs> what you do look in the mirror every day. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed by day by day. He began a good work, is carrying it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's his work, not yours. There's something happening inside that wants to get out and influence the, the flesh, the body. Remember what Paul says? I carry the death and the life so that the life might be revealed. It's mystical. It's spiritual. There's no 10 tick box plan to get there. This requires what we haven't been discipled from birth to do in terms of our thinking. There's no tradition that's got it nailed. You can be a raving liberal, a raving conservative. You can be, you know, high church, low church in between. That won't do this. It's something else. Those are helpful or maybe hindrances in worship and things, certainly in dividing the church. Father, may they become one, just as I am in you and you and me, so that the world knows you sent me. They might tear us apart or help us in our preferences. What did he go on to say? Renew day by day. And so, that sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds good. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul shipwrecked lashed, left for dead, thrown into prison all over the place. Was that a good witness? <laughs> well, make sure you don't get into trouble. It's a bad witness for Christianity. Paul's a, he's a jailbird. Everywhere he goes, he causes riots. Light and momentary troubles. His were not light and momentary troubles. But he's talking about a glory, eternal glory that outweighs them all. It's available. Father, I've given them the glory that you gave to me. It's here now. It's available. Again, off the scale. So we fix our eyes on, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for those who want to know. There we go. We're looking at something that can't be seen as Christians. It's something that's unseen. What's seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So if we go back to our passage, I wonder what you think it means when it says whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, think about such things. I wonder if like for so long, like me, you thought that was don't watch that dodgy film. Or don't go into that area. Jesus hung out with the dregs of society. Could you imagine? They threw parties in his name and he went. Can you imagine what the language was like? They weren't trying to impress any of the religious leaders. He was quite cool there. Why? Because he had a, a well-being that he understood that he wasn't being tainted, the agenda set by association with stuff outside because of his relationship with the Father. Brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or private, think about things. What is the highest, most admirable, pure, right, admirable thing, subject, whatever, without being heretical or picking the wrong term, that a human mind can contemplate? It's a question. Sorry. Did I not make it clear? Jesus. Yeah? What about Holy Spirit and Father? So you're right. God. God is true. God is noble. God is right. God is pure. God is lovely. God is admirable. Thank you. Excellent. You can, you can, if you want to take that verse and just apply it to some sort of external stuff, of what you can and can't do, then that will produce a certain type of faith in you. But if you read into that, that it's God. And what does it say right at the very end if you do all that? And the God of peace will be with you, union. That 
was what Paul was practicing, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put into practice. Practice. It's focusing on God. So, last, last bit. Using this diagram again that we've been using, okay? Um, let's say Thanksgiving in some circumstances, depending on the agenda, what's going on outside, okay? That's sort of normal human understanding, isn't it? Something bad's happening, so I shouldn't be expected to give thanks. Yeah? Okay. We wouldn't condemn, well, you would condemn somebody if you're a Christian and you keep trying to ram down their throat, rejoice in all circumstances, you're being sinful, you're not, you're not really being obedient to God, he's not loving you on this one because you can't do it. And you're over here, I'm trying, I'm trying. You know, that's how much Christianity is like that. So that's over here, to balance out, um, giving thanks in every circumstance. Well, good luck with that. But Paul said, sorrowful yet rejoicing. Oh my goodness, both at the same time. You've got permission to be sorrowful and rejoice. So let's have a look. There's the person orientated towards what's going on outside. Here's the person orientated towards, we all want to be here, don't we? But let's face it, <laughs> which one are we on? Where, where, where are we? Maybe flicking between the two. So. Thanksgiving is determined by external circumstances. Yeah? Makes sense. Totally makes sense for human beings. Thanksgiving is determined by internal things that can't be seen. Think about such things. Yeah? Prayer has an external orientation. Lord, see that over there? Please take it away. Lord! Up there, out there. God. Yeah? Yeah? crying out to them. Nothing wrong with that. But Lord, take that away. Take that away. Lord, take that away. Sort that out. Sort that out. And then I lined, all my ducks are lined up and life will be a bit better. Good luck with that one too. Prayer has an internal orientation. I am not affected by what's going on outside. <coughs> oh my goodness, why am I? It makes sense, but you say that that's not really what ought to be. You wouldn't ask me to be doing something. Why are you so downcast within me or so, like my soul? Isn't it obvious? Dialogue. Why are you like you are right now? Like, will he just shut up? Finish the sermon? What why are you why are you get why are you thinking what you think? And is it the spirit generating this stuff or not? Because you can think the most wonderful, amazing stuff that a human being can, and the fruit of that is off the scale. Comprehending things that are seen, comprehending things that are unseen, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All th you get this all stuff, this in everything, stuff that's going on. The practice and product of conventional thinking is this type of Christian life. There is a confession of Christianity and belief, but in terms of well-being, in terms of character, it's not becoming like Jesus. It, no malice involved or anything. It's just not seeing and orientating in the right direction. It hasn't been discipled. Not discipled with the right stuff. Discipleship has been information acquisition know more about the Bible, maybe you can even teach it. This, on the other hand, the practice and product of transformed thinking, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Don't conform to the patterns of the world, Christians. And that doesn't mean, you know, don't do this, don't do that, whatever. Don't think the way, don't have aspirations and expectations that the world does that a human being without all this other stuff has. Think differently. The practice and product of a transformed thinking. Don't conform to the patterns of the world, but be, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve, understand God's good, perfect, and pleasing will. Because it makes sense. So here is normal external orientation, and here is spiritual and internal. Now, this might sound like very foreign language to your normal Christian practice, 
But it's what Jesus was doing for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. It's what he did when he withdrew into quiet places often, all night sometimes. If he told his disciples not to pray with many words, then he wouldn't have been doing it, would he? And yet he's out there all night praying. Communion with the Father. Thinking about where he is. He grew in stature and wisdom and favor both with men and God when he was 12 years old. He was made perfect through suffering, the writer to the Hebrews tells us. Like us in every way, tempted like us in every way. In, in sinful flesh he came among us, yet without sin. So there's a different way of being a Christian, which fits into any tradition. So it's got to be of the Holy Spirit, hasn't it? Because Jesus prayed to the Father for union, for, for unity. Unity in character, perception, and it all comes down to love in the end. Thanksgiving. I hope there's a few morsels in there which has inspired you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that your plan, your provision is complete for every...